After several weeks of repairs and upgrades, Starship 24 resumed its pre-launch tests at Starbase. On Thursday afternoon, at 12.22 p.m., teams began loading propellants into Ship 24 in preparation for the static fire test. Vents were observed from the nose cone during propellant loading, indicating that header tanks were filled with propellant. The Raptor engine chill process began at 12.37 p.m., which was evident from vents on either side of suborbital launch pad B. While preparing for the static fire test, SpaceX also found time to test the ship's aft and forward flaps. At 1.01 p.m. local time, Ship 24 fired a single sea-level Raptor engine for roughly seven seconds, kicking off debris underneath the pad. The test was Ship 24's third overall static fire test, and the first after a series of repairs and upgrades. Over the past few weeks, workers have been adding reinforcements to the spacecraft's aft portion and working on the payload bay section. Moreover, SpaceX replaced a Ship 24 Sea Level Raptor last month after a dent was discovered in its engine bell. The dent may have been caused by the debris ejected from under the pad during the six-engine static fire test on September 8. The engine tested on Thursday was the replaced Raptor engine. The data from the test will provide engineers with crucial insight to assess the new engine's performance and the overall structural integrity of Ship 24 after its recent repairs and upgrades. A few minutes after Ship 24's static fire test, teams moved Super Heavy Booster 9 from the Mega Bay to the launch site. The booster features many design changes compared to previous prototypes. As you can see, Booster 9 hasn't received its 33 Raptors yet, and once they're installed, the engines will have shields to prevent accidents during testing or launch. The forward dome of Booster 9 has a pair of welded lines, which could be some kind of reinforcement to the dome where the grid fins are located. Now that Booster 9 has arrived at the launch site, SpaceX will prepare the booster for a cryo-proof test campaign in the coming days. Road closures suggest rocket testing at Starbase will resume on Monday, December 19. After completing the cryo-proof tests, Booster 9 will be sent back to the build site for engine installations ahead of static fire tests. In the meantime, Booster 7 may return to the launch site to complete pre-launch tests. Starbase launch site repairs and renovations that began two weeks ago following Booster 7 static fire tests are still ongoing. SpaceX continues to upgrade the berm wall that separates the launch pad and the tank farm. Teams are adding more and more shields to the berm wall to increase its height so that the exhaust from the booster Raptor engines won't damage the propellant storage tanks and related infrastructure. You may remember the new valves added to the propellant transfer lines of the orbital launch mount on December 7. Zach Golden of CSI Starbase figured out that the valve's function is to control the filling and draining of propellants into the booster during tests or launches. Previously, the fill and drain process was controlled by two valves installed on the booster quick disconnect. Therefore, there was a risk that an anomaly in the pad could damage the valves and leak methane and oxygen. The newly added valves, shielded from booster anomalies by the launch mount table, can stop the flow of propellants in the event of a mishap, thereby preventing further explosions on the pad. Stage 0 quick disconnect tests involving the booster quick disconnect, ship quick disconnect, and ship QD arm were performed on Thursday. The simultaneous activation of the quick disconnect mechanisms simulates the launch sequence, during which both the ship and booster QDs retract, and the ship QD arm moves away from the lifting rocket. The entire quick disconnect retraction process took about 15 seconds to complete. Starship 26 was fully stacked inside the high bay early Friday morning. Ship 26 lacks thermal protection tiles and flaps, and it is believed that the ship is an orbital depot variant designed to test orbital fuel transfer procedures. Ship 26 will be rolled out to the launch site for cryo-proof tests in the near future. Teams recently moved a Starship test tank, labeled Ship 26.1, from Starbase build site to SpaceX's facility at Massey's. This site, located approximately 7.5 kilometers away from the Starbase build site, was set up to conduct Starship test tank structural tests. SpaceX performs Starship test tank structural stress tests to gather the data required to improve Starship designs. Since SpaceX owns the 1.2 km road that leads up to Massey's from Highway 4, no road closure is necessary for Starship testing there. Starship work at SpaceX Roberts Road facility inside Kennedy Space Center is progressing rapidly. Five of the nine sections of the Kennedy Space Center's second Starship integration tower are now almost fully prefabricated, and work on the sixth section is ongoing. While prefabricating sections for the first tower months ago, SpaceX added plumbing, staircases, and other accessories to them. But such items are not yet installed in the sections for Tower No. 2. There are reports that NASA is concerned that a Starship explosion could seriously damage Pad 39A. 
Because capturing rockets is riskier than launching them, it is believed that SpaceX may decide to use Tower No. 2 to catch rockets launched from Tower No. 1 at Pad 39A. The exact location of the second Starship Tower at Kennedy Space Center is still unknown. Parts of Tower No. 2's rocket catching and stacking arms have been spotted at Roberts Road by Greg Scott during his recent flyover. Next to it, you can see the Starship Quick Disconnect Arm, Tower Arm Carriage, and Tower Arms designated for the Starship Tower at Launch Complex 39A. Recently, teams at Launch Complex 39A added a chain cable carrier to the Starship Launch Tower. The carrier will house the cables that supply power and communication to Launch Tower Arms and Carriage. Two months ago, Elon Musk tweeted that SpaceX is proceeding very carefully with Starship, as any mishap at the launch pad could cause months of delay in the rocket's development. During the Secure World Foundation's event on December 12, NASA Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy said SpaceX is making good progress on Starship, and the probability of the Starship going to blow up the pad during liftoff is very low. Now, let's discuss some of the major science and technology updates from the past week. The Artemis 1 mission came to a momentous end as NASA's Orion spacecraft made a successful ocean splashdown on December 11. Launched on November 16 atop a space launch system rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Orion has been on a 25-day mission that saw it fly by the moon twice. Passing as close as 130 kilometers from the lunar surface, the spacecraft used the moon's gravity to sling it into lunar orbit and then later return it on course to Earth. Forty minutes before entering the Earth's atmosphere, the Orion crew module separated from its service module and oriented itself so the heat shield faced a direction of travel. During re-entry, Orion endured temperatures of about 2,800 degrees Celsius, which is half as hot as the surface of the Sun. After entering the Earth's atmosphere, Orion performed a skip entry, descending first to an altitude of about 60 kilometers, then ascending to about 90 kilometers before completing the rest of the descent. The maneuver is designed to reduce G-forces on the spacecraft and also help the spacecraft accurately splash down in the ocean. Within about 20 minutes after atmospheric entry, Earth's atmosphere slowed Orion from nearly 40,000 km per hour to about 523 km per hour. The spacecraft then deployed its drogue parachutes, followed by three main parachutes, which slowed its descent to less than 32 km per hour. The spacecraft then made a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean, about 160 km off the west coast of the Baja Peninsula. The splashdown took place within 3.9 km of the target. After splashing down, the spacecraft was recovered by the recovery team aboard the U.S. Navy ship USS Portland by attaching a cable to the capsule and pulling it by winch into a specially designed cradle inside the ship's well deck. After arriving at Naval Base San Diego on December 13, Orion was offloaded from the ship to begin an overland trek to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Once Orion arrives at Kennedy, mission engineers will spend months examining data from the spacecraft to assess how it held up in deep space and during return trip through Earth's atmosphere. Technicians will also remove some hardware from the capsule for processing and reuse on Artemis II, the next mission in NASA's Artemis program. Artemis II is scheduled to launch astronauts around the moon in late 2024, and if all goes well with that flight, Artemis III will aim to land humans near the lunar south pole no earlier than 2025. A Soyuz spacecraft docked at the International Space Station suffered a significant leak on December 14, just hours before two Russian cosmonauts planned to perform a spacewalk. Video from the space station showed liquid spewing out from the rear section of the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft, docked to the RASBIT module of the space station. The leak was coincident with a drop in pressure in one of the external cooling loops of the spacecraft, indicating that the particles sprayed were the spacecraft coolant fluid. It's currently unknown whether the leak, which lasted for at least three hours, was caused by a collision with space debris or a micro-meteoroid, or whether a problem on the Soyuz spacecraft triggered it. We will have to wait for official words from NASA and Roscosmos in the coming days. According to NASA, all seven crew members aboard the space station were safe and not in any danger during the leak. However, with so much scientific equipment attached to the exterior, the agency may be concerned about the impact of coolant leaked on the surface of the station. Ground teams in Moscow are currently evaluating the potential impacts of the leak on the integrity of the Soyuz spacecraft, which carried cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Pedelin, and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio into the space station after launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in September. The Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft is currently scheduled to return to Earth with Prokopiev, Pedelin, and Rubio on March 28, but if the ground team finds that the spacecraft is not safe to carry crew, a replacement Soyuz would need to be autonomously flown up to the station to bring the crew back to Earth. 
as SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket successfully launched a Japanese moon lander and a NASA CubeSat on their way to lunar orbit. After a series of delays, the Hakuto R Mission 1 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on December 11. The Falcon 9 first stage, making its fifth flight, landed at the company's landing zone 2 at Cape Canaveral about 8 minutes after liftoff. 47 minutes after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage deployed the 340-kilogram Hakuto R spacecraft, as well as NASA's lunar flashlight, into a long-duration fuel-efficient ballistic lunar transfer trajectory. iSpace, the Japanese company that developed the Hakuto R spacecraft, started 12 years ago as a competitor in the Google Lunar X Prize, a competition run by the X Prize Foundation, to stimulate the development of commercial lunar landers. The Hakuto R mission has set 10 milestones between launch and landing, and aims to achieve the success criteria established for each of these milestones. During its trip, the spacecraft will get as far as 1.5 million kilometers from Earth before gravity pulls it back toward the Moon. After firing thrusters to enter lunar orbit, the lander will prepare for its final descent to the surface, which will occur before the end of April 2023. The mission's designated landing area, Atlas Crater, is located in the northeast part of the Moon. After touching down on the lunar surface, the lander will deploy a small United Arab Emirates rover, called Rashid, and an even smaller two-wheeled robot for the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. The 10 kg Rashid rover is designed to study the moon for 14 Earth days, using a set of scientific instruments. Two high-resolution cameras, a microscopic imager, a thermal imager, a probe designed to examine electrical charges on the lunar surface, and other tools are all part of the rover's arsenal. The 80-millimeter-wide Japanese transformable lunar robot, weighing just 250 grams, will deploy tiny wheels to roll across the lunar surface and collect data and imagery. The data it collects will aid in the design of a future pressurized rover to transport astronauts on the lunar surface. If NASA's lunar flashlight CubeSat survives its journey, it will enter a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the moon next year. The 14 kg spacecraft will spend most of its time 9,000 km away from the Moon, but occasionally fly within 15 km of the surface. During each close approach, the spacecraft will use an infrared laser instrument to search for water ice in permanently shadowed Moon craters. iSpace is planning to launch a second mission to the lunar surface in 2024. The mission, dubbed Hakuto R Mission 2, will include a lunar lander and a rover. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.